So, um, yeah, welcome from my side. Um, I'm going to talk about how to measure agreement in R, of course, in R. We're at R lunch today. And they say good presentations are a story. So I was thinking to present a story. I was thinking hard, what, what's the story for? And I thought, well, I'll just tell you the story for me or one of the stories about me. Um, and this is a true story. So it's um, tell a bit about how I got into um, into programming this package, basically to measure um, agreement in R. And I want to focus um, not on me, that's just a um, side story. I want to focus on, on functions, why we use functions and why it's good. Um, good to use functions where you should use um, uh, functions, etc. So um, my way to R, um, I started like many people um, in my generation, I started SPSS. Um, there's a computer, there's a, another package to do statistics. Um, I got into R because I needed to. And there were some new developments. It was um, propensity score matching and it just wasn't available in SPSS. And it was a choice between learning to program this myself in SPSS syntax or I'm going for R, where it's just available. So I went for R. And also because I wanted to, I mean, it was open science and all that stuff um, while we're here. Um, so I was keen on that. So it's like, let's do it. Um, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk about ordinal data. So this is an example of ordinal data. Um, does anyone want to tell me what's special about this? What's so special about ordinal data? Order, they have an order, yes. They come in order from one to six on the screen, yes. Exactly. So um, I tend to use them as continuous because we have all the tools, correlations, regressions, etc. as continuous. Um, it's great, but sometimes, um, yeah, we don't want to because they um, we have an order, but we don't have the spacing between categories. So we know there is an order, but we don't know whether six is the same distance from the five than the, the threes from the two, for example. Right, so that's the ordinary data we use a lot in the social sciences. Um, this is nothing special. Um, but yeah, that's the data. Now this, the project and um, the story is really, I'm doing my postdoc in a project on politicization. So it's an EU project. Um, politicization, we have a concept, it's um, two aspects, one is the salience, so salience means there is a lot of things, a lot of talks, lots of newspaper articles in our case on the topic, and it's polarization, disagreement, okay, so you need both. Um, you can think about that, you can think, um, uh, yeah, issues um, politicized at the moment is um, the situation in Israel, so we have um, a lot of news stories about it, and you have different positions um, on that. Um, a story that wasn't very politicized initially is the refugees from the Ukraine, for example. Um, there was a lot of newspaper articles, but it wasn't much of a disagreement because everyone thought, well, we have to help them. Later on, of course, the politicization set in. Okay, so it's just set up, um, and we have um, this data like this, and we want to measure polarization. So conceptually, um, yes, okay, polarization is when there's a lot of things going on at the poles. Uh, <clears throat> yes, intuitively it's easy. We want to do that, of course, systematically. We have a big data set and measure it in uh, from a scale from minus one to plus one in five categories. So it's really um, categorical. Um, and it's not quite, it's really ordinal um, as, as a data set. So we have that challenge, we have the discussion, can we treat it as continuous or should we not? Well, we come to the conclusion that maybe we shouldn't treat it as continuous. And so we have a challenge of measuring polarization on um, ordinal data. The standard way to measure um, polarization, um, yeah, I think if you have continuous way, we would run for the standard deviation. I think we're all familiar with that. Um, standard deviation is large, then ER and the poles. If it's uh, if there's agreement, then the standard deviation is, is small. Um, <clears throat> but yes, the problem, of course, then you have to make this assumption of equal spacing, and we discussed it in a team, we discussed it with the coders, and we came to the conclusion that we cannot assume that equal spacing. Um, so it's evaluation of the of our data. 
Right, so we have uh, really ordinal data, uh, not what we wanted. Uh, yes. So what happened is my colleague came and said, well, um, a colleague of my colleague, um, uh, this um, um, case for F. Under Eich, he has developed an algorithm and it's, it's been programmed in data. So we just run everything there. And I said, well, great. I just don't use data, right? Um, so for me, as an R user, this was not an acceptable state of the world. Um, we have code in data and not in R. Um, so that was a bit of a dilemma um, because it was an algorithm. I looked at the paper, it wasn't so straightforward. Um, but yeah, in the team we discussed it and we wanted to use that measure, it, it makes sense. It's developed for ordinal, um, ordinal data. Um, yes, so the dilemma um, got a solution. I got down to with the paper and I read it. And this is the paper. Um, it's full of numbers and equations. And um, it was, I haven't read a paper like this for many um years, I would say, I really read it until I really understood everything. So I had to not just get the intuition right, but I have to also get the code and the algorithm right, and then think how to implement this in R. Um, but the implementation wasn't so difficult. It was more the understanding what's going on. Um, yes. So, yes, that's really how I came to do what um, I did. And then, of course, then we have the code in R, and the world was good again. So we have we're happy to we have to rely on data for that. Um, so what does that mean? Implementing in R and we have an algorithm, it means um, creating a function basically. And that's what I want to focus um, in this, in this um, talk today. So a function is really, um, or I realize I need a function. It means that you, you can you do a calculation to some data and you do it, you can do it, you program it once in a function, and then you can apply it again and again and again. You really need that function. And the principle behind is, is the don't repeat yourself principle. So you can code it once, you solve the problem once, and then you solve it properly. It's good, you run it again and again. And you use it all the time and use R. You use functions every time you use R. Um, one benefit is because you solve a problem, it's done. Um, you don't have to repeat yourself, you just use the function. The other one is when there is a problem with your code, you fix it, you fix it once, you don't have to go back to every time you used calculated agreement in our case, you just fix the, the function and then everything is fine. And just to give you an idea, um, the package is in version 110, I just checked before. So there were a couple of fixes, most of them are of course documentation, but there also fixes in the code. So. Um, yes. Okay. So yes, um, you use functions. There's some examples when you use really basic stuff in R, like joining two values with um, C. That's a function. Okay. It's been programmed from you, and you you can do again standard deviation again functions. You use it. Um, bring a run the regression and analysis. So it's always the same thing. It's been fixed. It's been solved once, and you can run it again and again and again. Right. Okay, so in that case, we didn't want to calculate the standard deviation. It was kind of agreement to get you know get the data out of the project and come out with a score for agreement. Right. So let's build it, and then that's the basic idea of a function in R. If you ever have programmed functions in R, this is what you have done. This is a trivial example just to give you an idea how functions work. Is you start on the left here is the the SQ. Um, this is a function to square numbers. Fantastic, you really need that. Um, so first is the number as a name. So my function is gonna call it SQ for squaring numbers. And then to tell um, that's my object, right? Then, then equal to put something in the object. I use the function keyword to say, well, it's gonna be a function. In Braxis, I have a, an X, that's an argument. So I'm gonna deliver some data to my function. And then you have to, the curly brackets and there is the code, the result I want to calculate. This is trivial, of course, like X uh, multiplied by X. Um, but then between these curly brackets, you can have a lot of code and you can have code that refers to sub functions, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's really powerful because you build it once. Um, if you need to square a lot of numbers, 
maybe you want to do something like that. Okay, so in this example, we just have to date the date is number three. So square, of course, uh, is nine. It's quite easy. Um, so if it wants and use it and use it again, so throw any number at it. Now that's easy. Now what you probably don't realize, or maybe do realize, because you're all a proficient R user in this room, um, I can also throw a number of numbers, right? I just throw a vector at this because this is R, everything's vectorized. So I just get four square numbers um, just like that. Um, so that's a benefit when you, you program it in, in an environment like R, you get the benefits that in R, you just, so you don't have to, yes, create a function for multiple numbers. You just use the, what's built in, right? So, how to use when you build a function. Um, you have, I think you have three um, ways to use a function. One is um, you just create your function and then later on in the same code, you use it. So I need to square these four numbers. I write a function and then calculate these numbers and get the um, square numbers out of it. I use that, for example, when I um, when I do um, custom figures in R, so like I have a descriptive report, I have to do 15 times the same figure with different data, create it once in the code in a function for this. That's only for this report, so it's a function there and I'll just repeat it later on. Another one is um, you create, you put your function in a different document, um, I'll put that in a folder somewhere, you find them again. Um, and then you use the source command in R and you load all the functions in there. That's handy if you have a couple of functions that you need every couple of days or every day, whatever it is. <clears throat> and you don't want to copy and paste. Um, you shouldn't copy and paste anything anyway. Um, then you can just source the, the functions and they're ready for you. Um, and then I think the, the the maximum version of that is you create a package. And I'm, today I'm not going to talk about creating a package, um, but that's kind of the, the maximum thing. You use packages. I'm sure you use packages. I don't know anyone who does not use packages in R, but um, you can create packages relatively easy. Um, the difference between the source document and the package is that um, R insists that you document your functions, etc., which is a good idea because I forget what I program about two hours, but um, um, yes. So the documentation is also good for us. Um, yes, so the package is, yeah, if you want to build packages, there are lots of tutorials out there, of course, um, but don't rely on tutorials, just a first time experience, um, go for the R documentation. The official documentation is so good. I mean, it's super technical and super dense. But if you follow their instructions, your package will just run. And I've worked, I mean, friends of mine program a package and they used the tutorial here and tutorial there. And we had to debug the package many times over. And if you just follow the structure from the developers, it works and so, yes. Right, so um, yeah, we package um, the thing I did that. And I think the benefit of when you have a package is like when you have a document with your which you can source, you can have multiple functions in it. And this is exactly what happened in, in my case. So we had this algorithm programmed, um, but then we, as I keep working on polarization, I found there are other people who have solved the same problem of calculating agreement or polarization in ordinal with ordinal data in a different way. And that was a bit of puzzling to me. It's like, how can you have different solutions to the same problem? I mean, we have one standard deviation typically, um, you didn't have that many. Anyway, so why why are the different a bunch of different formulas? You have different algorithms. Um, it, it was easy for me to add it because the whole structure was there. Just added created the functions, um, but it was puzzling, and I'm going to come back to that puzzling thing. When programming functions, um, I think the two things. When, as I said, when you do a package, you are kind of forced to provide um, documentation. If you just create your functions. You have to, um, you can just program, but the recommendation is really to you comment your code. And I use, I do both. I'm going to comment my code and have the documentation because it's not exactly the same thing. The idea of the documentation is, you know, you have a problem, it's difficult to program. You go to Stack Overflow, um, you have a chatbot, you have a tutorial, or um, you use try and error. That's also a way. Um, 
I use sometimes until it works. And then I add to comment why it works and how it works, right? Um, the same thing with the help is just describing how our function works. Okay. So yeah, I package and I just want to highlight something that's um personally not that important for me, but I want to highlight if, if we talk about um function packages. I, I developed a package and was very excited at the time. Um it was at the time we only had about a thousand packages for our this is um, today is the Wild West um because it's so easy to create packages. But I was very excited and I made it available for others. I said, well, it took me quite a while to understand the algorithm, to program it, and then why not make it available for others? Um, it's out there, people use it. And um, for me, it's always funny, like um, I have zero citations on this, but I have um, 68,000 downloads, okay? <laughs> so this is, um, I'm talking to people in computer science, this is normal, right? People use software, um, it's not something like a paper which is signed. And I find that in a way, um, I could be disappointed about it, but also I find it satisfying because I can see people use it. So I created something that's that's useful for some people and if they don't cite it, well, um, I'm not gonna have any negative impact because of that, so, yes. So yeah, software, it tends to be used. And if you, if you do that, I mean, this is not ggplot where, which gets cited, but even ggplot has a couple of thousand mm -hmm. citations and has millions of users, so you get the, the idea there. Right. Why do we create a function? Why do we create a package? Because it replicates. And that's where really um, R comes in and where um, we had the thing. The, the good thing is then I could do all the analysis that my colleague did in state. I could do in R um, and I could do more of with it. I could um, create graphs like this. And this was a project. We had seven countries. We had 15 years over time, you have different ways to slice the data by act by different things. Um, so a lot of different ways to calculate polarization or agreement. And once we had a function, um, I always imagine doing that in SPSS, you have to click and click and click every time. Um, and you can um, use it and apply it many times. And that's also where S apply or all the apply functions in R come handy. You have to function you can apply them to a data set, you can apply them to a subset, etc. And it becomes really efficient. And I had no problem like, okay, can you try it with only left wing parties? Yeah, no problem. Okay, it's just a subset. So the drawback of that was I happened to do all the analysis after that, because it was just much more efficient. I did all the graphs for all the countries, I did all this sub analysis, etc, x analysis, because it was it's a matter of minutes once you have it. And so that's really the, the idea of don't repeat yourself because once it's in your function, it's, it becomes really um, efficient. Right, so that's the project. Um, but as I say, you know, you have different way, I have came across these different ways to measure different formulas. And that was really puzzling to me. Like, why is it we have different solutions and why does it matter? I mean, is one of them correct and the others are wrong or, or all the wrong or it's puzzling and I like puzzles and like, so um, I didn't stop there. I didn't stop with the project. I continued and one thing is of course programming and the other thing is then substantive question, what's what's behind it? Um, yes, so um, yes, what should I say about that? Um, so we have this bunch of functions, a bunch, bunch of formulas, and um, I want to find out what's going on. Um, I'm not a mathematician, so um, the functions, I can handle them, I can translate them into code, but I can't do all the fancy math in it and um, just look at the functions, see which two are equivalent, it's a, because they're presented in different ways. It's very hard for me, and what I do in that situation, I run, I go for simulation, right? Simulation is easier for me. I can just apply and do things over and over. Um, and that's, that's the idea here as well. You have different ways and we can simulate them and see what's coming out. Um, it's easier for me than doing the math um, because, yeah. Okay, so we had four ideas um, to how to go about to solve this problem. And the first thing is I had Clem. Um, he was an intern and Clem is, I think the ideal social scientist out there. He did mathematics as an undergrad and social science as a postgrad. So he has all the computer skills, all the mathematical skills, and then on top of that, all the theory. So this is 
my dream of uh, I think a social scientist, you have the skills, computer, computational science, and you also have the, the theory. So it's not just numbers, it also means something. So he was doing an internship with us, and um, I just talk about this and said, well, okay, I'll have a look at the formulas. And then he could demonstrate some things that I had an inkling, and maybe there's the same. He could just do all the magic on paper and suddenly say, well, this is, you know, I can prove it, it's the same thing. So some of the formulas just fall out because we, well, thanks to climbing, now we know that just variations of the same thing. We can generalize that. That's, I think, the ideal case, but we're still left with a couple of um, different variations. The, we had three empirical ideas there. One is of um, specific cases where we know there is agreement or where we know there's complete polarization and see how the different measure work in this case. Um, we did that. And then we had another idea, which is well, if it were continuous, if it wasn't ordinary, well, we just used the standard deviation, right? So we created latent functions that are distributions where we can calculate the standard deviation. And then we slice this distribution and create the ordinal data because we created them. We know what's the underlying real distribution. And then we can compare against the gold standard, right? So we know in reality, that's the continuous distribution. We create this ordinal data, we can slice it whatever we wanted, and then we calculate the scores and compare them. Um, the fourth idea was not really a new idea, but we just take it back to um, the actual project because um, as we started doing that, it's like, well, maybe, you know, they just maybe just trivial small differences. And in practice, it doesn't matter, right? Maybe it's the sixth digit after the comma, and we really shouldn't care. Um, so it was also kind of a test. Does it matter in 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 reality? Um, yes. So um, yeah, for the math, um, I'm not going to show you the math um, here. Um, but for um, specific cases, we could um, rely, and that was fantastic. We had um, Tesla and Wehrman was two of the authors who created their own algorithm, um, a formula. Okay, and to show the world that their formula is better than the standard deviation, they created all these specific cases, which are theoretically important variations of a case so you have sequences if you shift mass and distribution from one category to the other um, what happens to the outcome so that's fantastic we have a list of distributions um and uh, already discussion why it's important um we also created a um, couple of our own which we thought were important so if you look at the distributions here on, on the screen um yeah you can um, for example, if you start with the letter H, um, uh, no, start with the letter K, for example, does you have the perfect polarization and then you go to Q and R and S, you just shift one side moves closer to the other pole and the other pole doesn't shift. So polarization intuitively gets smaller until you reach the, the position of T where it's just one position, everyone agrees. So we have no polarization, you have agreement. So there is a bunch of sequences in it, and you can just test whether intuitively your, your measure works. Um, yes, so that's the first part. So we have this dis um, distribution. And as I said, we already have the functions. It's already programmed. So this is the function after the mathematician um, um, tidied up a little bit. And you have um, functions in the functions, so it's because you're you don't want to repeat yourself in the function side. So we have all the different um, different formulas that exist. They draw on similar sub ideas. So we have sub ideas in the sub functions, and then the whole thing becomes much easier or shorter. So, and then that's a data set I showed you before, uh, just as vectors. Okay, and it's the same thing. So you have zero point five, zero point five. That's a perfect polarization, and all, everything else. Um, Yes, I think the one that's not visible and wasn't visible before, if you look at the letter case here um, and up to N, so you have perfect polarization, which is increase the number of observations, okay? So it should be no difference intuitively, you just have more observations, but um, maybe mathematically that's not the case. Uh, yes, so we have data. And we have a function, so it's, uh, it's just a matter of applying it. And um, this is basically 
the code that that we use. We use apply, and we have so we have the 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 data in not in a data frame, but just in in, in vectors. So we run through the vectors, and um, we calculate the the agreement scores for the different with the different uh, and then we come out with what you have at the bottom, which is a data frame with lots of numbers, and then. Interpretation starts like is it just the same? Well, you can first you see immediately you get different numbers, but um, maybe it's just, you know it's just a shift, or maybe it's translation or something. That's the harder part. That's once you have to function the package, the simulation was very easy. It's just applying it. Um, I could just also have I don't know it's twenty five times five, um, so one hundred twenty five lines for each separately rather than run a apply for this. Yes, just more error prone, but um, it's also possible. Right, so if you look at that um, thing, it's just the substantive part, you find very high correlations. Okay, So maybe it doesn't matter so much. You get high correlations between the measures. The only one that does not correlate you have here on the, on the right, that's where we have. So um, categorical standard deviation is just running the standard deviation on the categorical data, and you can see the correlations are very high as well. So it's just negative um, because it's logically inverted. And we took the log on that as well. And this, the third one we had um, is we divided by the number of observation to kind of squeeze the standard deviation in the, in a um, in a range from zero to one. Um, that just messes up everything basically. So. If you ever do anything, don't do that. <laughs> um, the idea was like all the other algorithms or um, formulas, they between zero and one, we can, and then it's like the standard deviation can go to infinity, and we don't want that. We don't like that. So, um, yes. So we have high correlations, but you already can see that they're not perfect lines. And um, so it's, yes, uh, correlations, but we, yeah, we still have these differences. Um, and if you look at um, just this sequence here, you can see it's not the same. Obviously, we've seen it's not the same. And you can see where um, you can really is trying to start understand what the differences are. All the measures that we have here for the perfect polarization, they agree it's perfect polarization. There's no agreement, right? On the other side, on the right-hand side of the plot, you have the T, perfect agreement. All of the measures say, well, this is perfect agreement. So at the edge, the extreme cases, there's no disagreement, it works. But we don't need an algorithm to calculate this, right? If I have everything in one category, I can tell you it's agreement, right? So it's more interesting what happens in between. And what happens in between, I mean, in this case, it's this case where you shift mass from one category to the other. And you can see that different formulas react in a, in a different speed if you want right some of them react more quickly and um some of them are just linear um, um if you look at the papers if ever you did that there is a reason some authors actually prefer measures that react more quickly they want to capture the smaller differences others want something linear um but if you prefer something that reacts more quickly like the green line here um so it's a square measure um that's great if you move from k towards the t, but if you move from the t towards the k the other way around, you um, you measure measure uh, reacts in a different um, way. So you really have to understand what you're doing. I'm not against this measure, but I think it's not just something you apply blindly, right? Right. Yeah. Um, Yes, so the correlations, just I put that here in the notes, I mean, the average correlation 0 0.9, it is extreme. Um, one reason of that, for that is supposed to be have very specific cases. We have constructed cases where like perfect agreement, we have perfect disagreement, where all the measures kind of agree. Um, so it's not the same thing, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe one thing that's important from, from the previous graph is that fact is standard deviation. I mean, we know, it can fail. Mathematically, we know it can fail, but empirically, even for these constructed cases, often it's not failed to capture agreement or disagreement. So it's not so obvious why Why do we need a complicated algorithm um, that takes a paper to describe if you can just have the standard deviation. And so that was a more empirical uh, question, yes. 
So yes, um, all the measures rack to changes. That's important. So um, there's no agreement on the implicit midpoint. That was something um, I have here in, with the gray line horizontally. Um, well, can we capture the midpoint between perfect agreement, perfect disagreement, uh, polarization agreement, and look at this graph, you can see the lines cross this midpoint at different points. So there's no agreement where, where the middle is. There's agreement what's extreme one side, the extreme other side, but in the middle, there is no agreement because they act differently. Um, the standard deviation does fail some of these cases. So those, I mean, all the algorithms that have been developed and all the formulas that have been proposed, they have, there's a reason when you checked for these specific cases, it fails, but often it doesn't fail. Um, all of them are um, robust to changes in numbers. I mean, just increase the number of observations. So luckily, um, it doesn't change anything, but it's just something you want to test. Um, Yes, it's really on the small, if you change something small that the measures react differently, where they come to show their different personality, if you want. Um, that's important because if you shift 1% in, in one project, in one research, that means something has happened. In another project, it means a measurement error, right? And you want a measure that's robust for your application. And one thing that I haven't shown, um, because it's just boring, um, all of the um, all of these approaches here, they fail completely when we change the number of categories. And that's a very important thing if you think about it, if you think about your ordinal data. We have five points, um, and if you measure it seven, because you just subdivide one of the categories, uh, nothing should, should change, right? Polarization is the same, but for all these formulas and all these algorithms, it breaks down, it's a different solution. So, um, that means you cannot compare if you have not measured the same thing uh, in the same number of categories and you have to, um, yeah. So that's um, that's not a good property, I think. So in, in that sense, when you come to that level, to that result, you feel like, mm, maybe we need something else. I don't know. So mm, then we, that is the, the second approach that we have with latent distributions. So on this plot, you can have the dashed lines. These are the distributions that you can Define mathematically. So you have U curve, you have flat line, you have different peaks to the left or to the center. And then we just um, cut them, um, we just cut them uh, equally, or we can use the log to cut them just to make sure we, it's more arbitrary than how we cut them. Um, and then we just run the whole thing again and see what happens. Um, what you see in this plot is, and it's very small, but um, it's because it's so many numbers, basically. Um, the advantage of having a function or having all the functions in one package is that we can really run simulations. We can do bootstrap. This is everything is bootstrap with um, 5,000 um, cases. So we have the latent functions and we bootstrap. So it's not every time the same thing that gives us also a sense of the uncertainty around um, these numbers. Um, we have these five, we have the six measures, and you can see if you um, first gl pl um, glance, you probably say, well, it's the same. They're all kind of on the line. So it's this correlation thing again. We measure the same thing. If you then look at me more carefully and look at spacing between the numbers, which is the, the middle, the midpoint, uh, the mean number, the mean position, you can see the spacing is not always the same. So um, the same thing. And if you look at the column on the right, you can even see that the order between the five and the three categories is not the same on the x-axis. So this disagreement between, between the different um, formulas and the algorithm, whether in distribution five or distribution uh, five or two, uh, type three is more polarized. Okay. So that shouldn't be. I mean, there should be a correct answer to that. And here we just show that it's 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 not. Um, there's no, there's no clear one answer. So they measure slightly different things in that sense, right? And then we took it back to the data um, to see. Well, you know, okay, we see high correlations, but you also see differences. Is it really meaningful these differences? And we I just show you two two countries that we have. So we have on the x-axis you have the time. On the y-axis, you have this concentration or polarization agreement, whatever it, you want to call it. Um, do the different actors um, 
have this, the same or different position to what extent. Um, I think the first thing you notice, of course, all the lines are different. Um, that means really if you measure agreement in one way, you cannot compare that number to another one. Sometimes you have small numbers, sometimes you have bigger numbers um, for the same situation. Okay. Um, on the left, you have Austria. So here, my qualitative interpretation is really like, okay, they are two parallel. Okay, so some numbers are low, some are high, but when it goes down, it goes down for all of them. And it's, there is a peak, then it's a peak for every um, position. So maybe it doesn't matter that much. We can pick any of the, of the measures. We can use it. Um, I have this gray line again for the midpoint. And yes, as we found the midpoint, we cannot interpret. Um, there's only one, that's the algorithm, which would, uh, which um, by Van der Eyck, which um, has an explicit claim that the midpoint can be interpreted. Of course, the, all the others don't make that claim, but um, when we look at these numbers, we have our doubts whether it is really, um, the interpretation is so valid, yes. On the right, you have same data set as a different country, and that's the UK. Um, Again, you have parallel lines in a way, but you also have situations where um, if you look at the blue line, for example, um, the left-hand side of the plot, it looks like there's been no change in polarization, right? It's fairly flat. If you look at the other numbers, um, they identify a peak around 1998. So that's substantively completely different interpretation. Like, okay, little wiggle up and down in polarization or oh, hang on no that was a massive change and there's a peak in in politicization but substantively um a different interpretation so it does matter sometimes that's what we draw as a conclusion and the problem that we face with that um at least me who's not the mathematician um i cannot look at the data and see well okay that's a case where yeah, probably the measures react differently. And that's the case where it's like Austria, everything is the same. Um, so we're kind of stuck as, uh, I guess, uh, at least me as a lay person, no mathematician. Um, like, you know, sh should I anticipate a problem or not? Um, it's it's difficult. So, yeah, the, the conclusion that we draw substantively is really, um, if you have no idea, <laughs> which is for me always the case when I have data, try multiple measures, okay? Try different things. If they all agree, then if I if I had a peak everywhere, then it's pretty clear that there was a peak. Um, if it's flat everywhere, then I wouldn't argue much more. Use graphics because um, if you look at these things, um, if you just look at the numbers, it's difficult to see if you use graphics and that's with everything that we do, I guess, these days. Use the graphics, you understand your data, um, try to understand what you capture, um, that's the substantive part. Um, the technical conclusion I want to draw uh, here for so functions, of course, don't repeat yourselves because you don't want to. You're lazy. I don't know if you are. I am lazy. Um, I don't want to code too much. Um, it's easy to um, use and reuse your code. You apply it many times, do simulations, et cetera, once it's, it's, it's in functions. It's easier to, yeah, to recycle, it's more efficient, and also it's more, um, it's less error prone. So if you have an error, you find it, you fix it once and you don't fix it. Uh, did I change the comma in that code or not? I can't remember. So it's it's easier. Um, yes, my recommendation to you, if you don't already do it, um, use um, a source document to keep your code tidy and in one place. If you, have, you can have a couple um, of, um, of functions of ready for you and use packages to make your code more useful to yourself. And if you're generous, um, you can also share it with the world. But that is, I'll just tell you, it's a lot of effort to document and maintain a package. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna stop here. Um... I don't know, but sometimes the question, I, I don't know. Already the audience, if uh, some people have some question they would like to ask to uh, Dr. Reading. 
Uh, EDM go through the, the augmentation of different <coughs> categories. We said this back in one that stuff, but I'm very interested about that uh, because that would be my way to infer like uh, an integral is if the function, if you do like a maximum of uh, categories, you will arrive to the function, uh, the Latin function that you are describing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, why? Oh, did you, of course, I still really thought about that, but that would again polarize the different uh, algorithms for, for different uh, measures, or uh, because that's that's where the thing that you say and makes me really think that, yeah, augmenting the number of uh, categories that change then, what would you say? Um, yeah, the results. <laughs> yeah, the results, yeah. <laughs> Should be. yeah. So, how could find a way to not do that <laughs> how can we solve that yeah. i don't know <laughs> no i'm I, yeah i think this is a very important finding in a sense um yes um i don't i really don't know i mean we've we thought about it and we haven't got a an answer to that um i i think one thing is to recognize that if you assume there is a latent uh or the latent distribution um then all of the categories, all the ordinal data are just wrong because they're approximations. And you will find, but what we then show is that different ways to approximate this latent distribution are just different proxies, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's kind of problematic if you think about, you know, like, do we code in five categories and seven categories or whatever, right? And then you get different results. Maybe it doesn't matter that much because if you compare seven categories with seven categories, then it's comparable, but it's a problem. And if your project you use seven categories and I use five categories, and that's just like, okay, you have 0 0.4, I have 0 0.4. Ah, it's not the same thing, right? So it's, yeah. I haven't got a solution. So if you have one, um... <laughs> yes. Well, it was really cool to see your train of thoughts again from the problem to the, to the experimentation of the, uh, yeah, I was, I uh, heard that so many times and I even thought about the whole process of the video. How do you present the results at the end to, like, for example, to show that one approach has a bias towards that direction? Or do you present all the approaches? Um. But basically, in, well, it's on the review, but the paper that we wrote up so far, is we show the different approaches. I mean, all the equivalents, mathematically, they fall out because they're they're not interesting. Um, but yeah, we have this um, six formula, five formulas and one algorithm that's left. And we, we just go through what I presented today to show the different things. And the problem is that it's... Yeah, we, we don't have you know don't have a very strong claim to a gold standard. What we, we know this is valid. We know for the the latent uh, data that yeah we know that, but it's kind of difficult to to argue. Well, the, the closer you get to that, and then the closest you get is like have as many categories as possible, and then all the measures work again because <laughs> yes. So it's um it's, it's difficult. So we we conclude basically a bit of, a more elaborate than that, but um use different measures and know your data, which is never wrong. But <laughs> um yeah, it was also a bit frustrating in that sense. Like you know, you sit down, you do the simulations, and you think, like, let's, let's crack that. And um I don't know, maybe a mathematician out there can tell me that there is no solution to this problem. Um, but yeah. I checked the tab and there is no question. So let's congratulate the sector reading again. Thank you.